2015 had some good games, there weren't a lot of them. There were shining gems throughout the year, but all in all, it was a very average year for gaming, in my personal opinion. Nonetheless, I promised a top 10 video, and here it is. Somewhat late, but hey, it's here. Before I get started, I will tell you some games I never managed to play, so that if it doesn't appear on this list, you'll know why. They are... With that out of the way, let's get started. Number 10, Splatoon. A very fun game where you play as a squid boy or girl and go through puzzles and courses using your squid skills. While the campaign can be fun and cute, it's the multiplayer that attracts most people. You can fight alongside other players covering the turf with your ink color. The team with the most ink covering the field wins. It's an easy and fun game. There are also many different outfits, accessories, different ink weapons, skills. The music is great. The whole thing is just fun. Number 9, Ori and the Blind Forest. Ooh. Spider thing? Now, I know I haven't finished this yet, but believe me when I say it is a very fun game. It's gorgeous, and right from the start, you feel some sort of bond with Ori, as you get a voiceless prologue that shows some heart-wrenching stuff. You go around the world, destroying the corruption that is spread throughout the land in order to restore the world. Throughout the game, you pick up upgrades, such as double jumping, shooting attacks, and so on. The game is a fun platformer game that can get quite difficult at times, and if you forget to save, like me, you end up a long way away from where you died. While I do get frustrated, I really like the game, and I hope to continue it and finish it for you guys. Okay, let's do this again. Let's do this again. No wonder I avoided this side. Ah! Number eight. Life is strange. Check tracks, girl. Oh, whoa, no. Nathan's SUV. Hey, look, squirrel. Despite my verbal hatred of this game during the playthrough I did, it was an interesting game that deserves some credit. I finished it, right? That's saying something. There are many plot holes and things that really don't add up. The feeling of actions being pointless despite the game saying it would have dire consequences. When really, in the end, you can basically make it like it was all a dream or face your damn consequences for once, Max. Which is what I made her do. But the story was interesting. I felt for some of the characters, even if they were kind of strange and the dialogue was a bit weird and littered with random references, in the end, the story had some good plot twists. It had its strange moments, which made it true to its name. Would I play it again? Nope. If the same people who did this came out with a better polished game, I would definitely consider picking it up and playing through it. Ooh! <laughs> wow, okay. Number seven, Mordheim City of the Damned. As mentioned in my Game Light episode, this game is great fun. It is based in the Warhammer fantasy world and focuses on a side game created by a games workshop of the same name, Mordheim. You get to pick a band of warriors to fight under, scavenge a destroyed city, and get stronger. The mechanics in the game are tight and feel much like how the tabletop Mordheim would play, minus all the effort putting into making the terrain for the board and painting each of your own miniatures. Though to a fan of Warhammer, that's the best part. Anyways, the game plays as a turn-based strategy game, minus the character phase and enemy phase, allowing each side to move players according to their initiative. The game developers captured the atmosphere of Mordheim perfectly, right down to how the warband talks and acts. It's great fun and offers a lot of replayability. Number 6, Resident Evil Revelations 2. Moira. Welcome to the club. Uh. Reporting for duty, Ms. Redfield. When do the hazing start? <sighs> Cut it out. We've been friends for how long? Long enough that I'm allowed to give you shit. I am a sucker for Resident Evil games, no matter how stupidly over the top they become. The last game of this new series of Resi games, Resident Evil Revelations, was fantastic and captured the classic Resident Evil games that many people grew up knowing, myself included. So hearing that a second one was coming out starring Claire Redfield, one of the main protagonists from Resident Evil 2, and the dreadful Resident Evil Code Veronica, it just made my day. Even despite mostly being a co-op game that had some pretty dreadful moments. I have always enjoyed watching or playing Resident Evil 
Resident Evil games with my brother, and I was able to do it with this one too, so co-op was a lot of fun. The game centers around Claire Redfield and Moira Burton in the first part of the game, and then Barry Burton and this little girl named Natalia. The story is not masterfully done, but it gives a nice few twists and nods to the older games, something fans will like, even if they are kinda cheesy. The mechanics are the familiar over-the-shoulder shooting, melee attacks, healing items. While it wasn't nearly as great as the first Revelations, it had some good moments with some intense fights. One blaring frustration, though, that happens about halfway through the game, changes the ending for the worst possible outcome. And the way to change it isn't all that obvious either. I can hear the wind out. This must be the way out. Then we need to find a way through. Number five, Until Dawn. Starting up this game, I was expecting stupid fun about teenagers having a party in a cabin in the woods. I got that with all the cheesy dialogue and cliche horror moments, and I was very happy with just that. Party like we're fucking porn stars, okay? Make this one trip we will never forget, alright? Yes! <laughs> but then the game changes, and definitely for the better. The plot expands to something much bigger than the player anticipates going into the game, and it delivers something quite dark and chilling. And while yes, the game is a linear, quick-time event riddled playthrough, there are some dire moments where you can fuck up big. The game tries to guide you by placing totem pole pieces around, showing you a snippet into the future to warn you about something. There are five different colors, with black indicating death, red as danger, orange as loss, yellow as guidance, and white as fortune. This can somewhat skew your actions, but only if you understand the context of the vision, which can be difficult. In the end, the characters are pretty good, some more than others. The scares are pretty good, the story, well, you only have to play it once to get the full experience. That unfortunately leaves it as a one-play only game, but it was a good play! Number 4, Undertale. The game everyone is raving about, and rightfully so. This game is an RPG that changes so many things and makes you experience a pretty deep story. Right off the bat, everything is different from a typical turn-based RPG. You can dodge attacks in the little square in the middle of the battle menu. You can fight, talk to monsters, show mercy, and spare them. You actually never have to fight anything ever if you choose to. What makes this game shine, in my opinion, is that the characters are very memorable, the jokes aimed at typical RPGs are great, the humor is silly but funny, and it can be challenging if you're not paying attention to hints, clues, and dodging things to stay alive. Read everything, be peaceful, and enjoy the game. The less you know about this game, the more you'll enjoy it, which is why I won't say much more than this. <laughs> Fallout 4 Yeah, yeah, lots of people love the highly anticipated game of the year. I mean, the hype behind this was insane. Was I hyped for this? Of course I was! And I've played 106 hours and I've had a good time. What I can say about Fallout 4 is it's like 3 but more polished and has more added features, but overall nothing absolutely mm -hmm. amazing comes out of it. The plot starts off with you and your husband or wife and your child, Sean. This fuck face. You sign off to be part of this vault tech program, and seconds later, hey, nuclear bombs start dropping. Thank god you signed up! So you enter the vault, get frozen, and now you're in the future trying to locate your baby. The story is pretty similar to Fallout 3 with the whole searching thing, and while the plot twist at the end is pretty cool, I wasn't nearly as impressed as I called it about five hours into the game. So what's improved? Well, there's weapon customization, companion flirting and romances. Your thoughts? Next person that asked me to shag is getting a well-placed kick. If you get my meat. Graphics updates, spoken dialogue from the main character, a new way of leveling up perks, legendary creatures that drop legendary gear, and there are a few multiple endings that differ depending on what faction you joined. All very interesting, but again, ultimately, nothing has changed. Still damn fun though, clearly. <laughs> Number
number two, Darkest Dungeon. Ruin has come to our family. You remember our venerable house? Opulent and imperial. Darkest Dungeon is like a turn-based Dark Souls game. It is a dark fantasy RPG that involves you gathering a group of mercenaries and fighters to tackle various dungeons surrounding your accursed estate in order to destroy bosses and push back the darkness that is spreading. Your party can suffer from a number of ailments, ranging from diseases to complete insanity upon gazing at the monsters that attack them. Your party will suffer from negative perks and traits, crippling them every time they venture into the dungeons to fight and clear the objective battle system, which is a major part of the game, is great and takes character position and attack range into consideration. If your party is out of place, prepare to feel pain so it's best not to get too attached to the characters as death is very common. Even when you are fully prepared, the game throws critical hits that take off most of your health, insane characters who will refuse your instruction. It's madness! This roguelike dungeon crawler's 2D side-scroller game is great fun. And just to add a nice touch to it, there is a narrator that talks during your dungeon crawling and gives you a chilling message each time he talks. Even if you are doing well, he warns you not to get too full of yourself, which is damn good advice. Number 1. Bloodborne. I say? I'm in love with the Dark Souls series. Why wouldn't I love Bloodborne? I could talk about this game for ages. I've played it to death and it never gets old. Where to start? Bloodborne is an action role-playing game that stems from the Dark Souls franchise. It is famously challenging, it punishes bad players, and the story is so incredibly deep, but you can miss almost all of the narrative if you don't think about it yourself. The story in these games are never given to you on a plate, but can be discovered through items, interactions, connections, and just your own thoughts and interpretations. Something many games are afraid to do, as they want to push an entire story onto the player that is clear-cut, and they won't have any mistakes stakes understanding it. The story takes place in a gothic city of Yarnum, where many people are infected with a strange blood disease. You, the player, awake during the hunt, and you must battle beasts and monsters to figure out just what all of this is. The battle mechanics are similar to those of Dark Souls, except you have no way of blocking damage with a shield. Instead, instead you take a more aggressive stance in fighting, and you may attack and heal some of your health back. You are also equipped with a gun, where you can damage and stun them, and leave them open for a repost that deals large amounts of damage, but are tricky to pull off. You may also alter your weapon of choice to two different settings, some giving more reach while others adding on an extra piece of weaponry. There are always a variety of items to heal, distract, improve stats, etc, and a variety of weapons and armor to switch and match. What I love is the story and the theories pieced together from the evidence given in the game, and with the new DLC out, it gives even more background and detail of the creation of this mysterious blood disease, who was involved, and what some of the big names actually mean. While these games aren't for everyone, once you sink your teeth into Bloodborne, you won't want to stop playing. That wasn't necessary of you, but you have my thanks. We made it with our lives. You're not bad at all. You must have killed Gascoigne as well, then. <laughs> <laughs> 